We've been talking about graphs, which give us a, th a theory of structure, what's connected to what. And we've been talking about games, which give us a theory of behavior, how I reason about what you're going to do and how that affects what I do. Now we'd like to bring these two things together, and we'd like to talk about how strategic behavior takes place on networks. In the process, we're going to see a whole bunch of interesting concepts. We're going to see how markets can be viewed as having a network structure. We can see how, we're going to see how prices can serve to decentralize a market, and how this can all lead to optimal allocation of resources to people. But before we get to all that, we'd like to start with a very simple story that illustrates the link between networks and behavior. And this is going to be a very simple story about assigning dorm rooms to college students. And to make this an example we can actually talk about and work through, we're just going to think about four students and trying to give them four dorm rooms that they'll be happy with. So we're going to have four students, let's say W, X, Y, Z, or let's give them names like Wendy, Shin, Yoram, and Zach. And the idea is that the college dorm administrator asks them for their requests. There are four rooms. And different students like different rooms, right? So you might like a room because it's bigger or it's on a higher floor, it's sunnier, whatever. And so these requests get submitted. And let's say Wendy, the first of our four students, says, I want room one or two. And Shin, I guess Shin is very picky. She says, I, I want room one. That's, that's really her clear preference. Uh, Yoram wants room two or four. And Zach, Zach is easygoing. Zach will take anything. The first thing we'd like to do is take this description of the story and represent it as a graph. And so what we're going to do is we're going to write down some nodes. So there's going to be a node for each of the four rooms, and there's a node for each of the four students. Now, here's where we need to figure out what the edges are. The edges are going to connect each student to the rooms they want. Okay, so we splash these in there, and Wendy says, okay, she's connected to room one and two. Shin is connected only to room one. You see Zach down there. Zach's connected to all four of them, your arm to two and four. That's, that's our graph. Now, what is the problem the dorm administrator is actually trying to solve here? They want to give each student a room that they want, and so that no one, you know, no two people end up in the same room. So we could kind of think through how we'd do this. We'd say, all right, so, so Shin, Shin has to get room one, and Wendy only took one or two, so Wendy's gonna have to get room two, because Shin got room one. And actually, Yoram needed two or four, uh, but two is taken by Wendy, so your mom's going to get room four. And, and Zach, we always count on Zach to bail us out, right? Because I guess Zach will take room three, and we're done. We have assigned each student a room that they wanted. Right? And that is how we took people and their preferences, we built a graph, and we solved a problem of allocating resources optimally. Let's talk about what this structure was that we were working on. Yes, it's a graph, but it was a special kind of graph, one where the nodes came in these, in these two columns, the left and the right. They really have two types, and the edges all went between the two types. We'll call that a bipartite graph, bipartite for two parts, I guess, and um, edges always go between a node on the left and a node on the right. They always connect students to rooms in this case. Now, what's interesting here is that bipartite graphs can model this situation, but they model lots and lots of things. They really model any situation where I'm trying to pair up some things with some other things. So for example, I could be a hospital administrator trying to assign doctors to shifts. And I maybe have four shifts, you know, Saturday at eight, Saturday at 10, Sunday at two, Sunday at four, these weekend shifts that maybe are hard to fill. And I have four doctors named W, X, Y, and Z. And Dr. W can do Saturday eight or 10, but can't do Sunday. Dr. X is very picky. They can only do Saturday at eight and so forth. And I take these doctors' preferences and I write a bipartite graph. And you see it's really, it's the same graph and the same problem, except now it's doctors and shifts. And maybe instead we actually have some other problem. We have four airplanes have just landed in a little five minute window at an airport. There are four gates that are free, but they can't all go to all gates. There's a big jumbo jet needs a certain gate. A small commuter plane needs to be in the commuter part. And so I've got these four airplanes and maybe, you know, Delta Flight 96 needs to be at gate B6. And so that's a, you know, that's a tight constraint. And I have to think about all these things. And again, it's the same problem. So bipartite graphs come up in many, many contexts, right? So students in dorms, doctors and shifts, airplanes and gates, uh, fire crews and emergencies they need to get to, all of these where I'm trying to match something up to something else. And the problem that we solved in all of these cases was what we'll call the perfect matching problem. How to give each person something that they're willing or able to take. So a perfect matching in a bipartite graph, if we want to make this precise, is a way of assigning nodes on the left to nodes on the right that satisfies two things. One is each node on the left is assigned to a different node on the right. And the other is that each node on the left actually has an edge to what it's assigned to. 
right? So if an edge represents, in this case, students willing to take dorm rooms, that means each node, each room, actually is okay with the student that I give it to. Okay, so this is the kind of problem that we're gonna face. We're gonna be given a bipartite graph, like we see here, and we're gonna ask the question, does this graph have a perfect matching? That's the question that we started out with. We looked at this graph, and we worked hard, and we found a perfect matching. And it's the one that we just saw. But we could take lots of graphs and ask if they have perfect matchings. I could, for example, simply remove that edge between your ROM and room four. Your ROM got slightly more, slightly more picky here. And you could ask, is that all it takes to destroy the perfect matching? Maybe there's some other perfect matching that pops up. Maybe if I thought harder, I'd find a different way to solve the problem. And I, I look at it, it certainly seems hard, because you know, Shin still needs room one, but Wendy has to take two, but doesn't that leave your ROM out? Seems impossible. Is there an easy way to convince you, or convince myself, or convince these students that it's impossible without really walking them through all the reasoning I was doing? It turns out there is something kind of nice that I can show them that would just immediately make them realize this problem is unsolvable in this particular case with this few edges. And the answer is as follows. I take Wendy, Shin, and Yoram, and I say, those are three people. They need three different rooms. Collectively, how many rooms are they willing to take? Only rooms one and two. That is all that they're willing to take. Right? So between the three of them, the sum total of their preferences produces rooms one and two. But I can't fit three people into two rooms, and so this problem is unsolvable. I don't need to go through any elaborate reasoning. I just show you Wendy, Shin, and Yoram, who collectively only want two different rooms. And if I had to convince them that they've been too picky and there's no solution, that's all I would have to do. I'd say, look, you people only wrote down room one and two. You need to get more expansive in your preferences. That's a useful thing, because it says when there is a perfect matching, I can demonstrate it. I show who gets what. And in this case, there wasn't one, and I could demonstrate that. I could show this, this set that was somehow constrained or constricted. But is that always true? Maybe sometimes when there's no perfect matching, the only way to see why is to just plow through all these possibilities and engage in this very complicated reasoning. That's something we'd have to, have to worry about, right? So it's gonna turn out that this problem has a very, very nice tractable structure. That when there is a perfect matching, I show it, and whenever there's not a perfect matching, anytime there's not a perfect matching, there's a simple explanation of the flavor that we just drew. And so this notion that there's this one kind of obstacle to perfect matching, this, this, this constraint on people, that's gonna be essential to how we think about resource allocation and ultimately how we think about network structured markets. And that's what we'll start thinking about next.